that Kevin has been working on. I've been trying to get the spacing right on these brochures. This will be a nice, efficient way of introducing. This brochure says, Did Jesus call this woman a dog? It's from Matthew chapter 15. And actually, we can, uh, we can go up onto the screen. And I will... <laughs> I will... I'm just getting there too, Reuben. We can go up onto the screen. And we can show you some of the new tracks that we have been working on. So we'll go, it should go to the screen. There we go. If you go to the website, maranathamedia.com, and in the books area, you'll see on the list there, for those of you who don't know, you can click on the word books, and that will give you all of the books in theme order, the Father and the Son and all those things there, it's quite handy there, but in the, in the menu for books, down the bottom is the word tracts, we are starting to develop some tracts, and there is, did Jesus call this woman a dog, and you can download that, print that, you can print thousands of them on your printer, 
and you can hand them out and put them in letterboxes. You can hand them to people. Do you think? Do you think some people out there would be interested to know why Jesus called appeared to call this woman a dog? And on the back, on the back of the brochure, we have. You have been reading an excerpt from the book Agape, a revelation of God's character of love. Download the entire book for free at fatheroflove.info, and it ha- we've put a little. Uh, QR code on it, so if you have one of those on your phone, you can just put that on there. It'll take you straight to the website, and you'll be able to download the book Agape. So we're going to produce some quite a range of these to be able to hand out. And if you, in your neighbourhood, you want to do a little bit of letterboxing, you can print some of these out yourself and letterbox them. How does that sound? Does that sound all right? So we have some other ones. Uh, we've mentioned this last time, Is This God's Anger? This is an introduction to the book uh, Acts of Our Gentle God. Is This God's Anger? And uh, Jay has a very good explanation of what God's anger is in chapter 13 of the book Acts of Our Gentle God. It's excellent. So again, you can download this and just press the download button here and you will see that the entire brochure will or the, the uh, tract will come up for you. And there we have it. And again, you have the, uh, the QR code there so people can, if they are into those types of things, which uh, I think some people are, you can download those. And we'll continue to produce. We have some others. Lord of the Sabbath. This is for... What's, the, what's that the introduction to? That's a little one for the... Sabbath. Fountain of... Ble- yeah, Fountain of Blessing. That's for Fountain of Blessing. Fountain of Blessing is a new book, by the way, which is an upgrade from Sabbath Fountain for outreach purposes, introducing the festivals to people and the Sabbath hug principle in a Bible-only uh, Bible format and introduces some important history there. So, and this is a, a flyer that we can, uh, we can, you can print them out, double-side them, put them into a trifold, hand them out to people, and it's very cheap and efficient to be able to introduce people to some of our publications. So uh, that will be uh, that'll be a great blessing. So when you, if you want to look for those, as I said, books, and we have a section called tracts. There, you can download any and all of those and start hitting the streets and handing them to people. So we just wanted to to make you aware of of some of those. Uh, I think I did mention the other day that not not to, that the people online is uh, well. Some of you online, but we've now taken stock of cross-examined and cross-encountered, offering a new perspective on the cross with the new cover. With the new cover. I've been so blessed in the past week. Uh, the uh, our brethren in France and in Bulgaria, they took it upon themselves to completely redesign their versions of Cross-Examined and into the new format. Uh, and that takes quite some work. It's quite beautiful and the illustrations and everything in here. Uh, and we really, really want to get this book to, to people to get them to re-examine what they understand the cross to be. Of course, this presents this gospel of the kingdom, Christ suffering over a 6,000 year period and the agony that he goes through, the agony that he's going through today because of his wayward children who have the wrong fear of him and therefore they live in a manner that causes them a lot of grief and a lot of sorrow. A lot of people suffering today and of course we are being reminded uh, around the world that black lives matter. Well, black lives matter to our Father and our Saviour, don't they? All lives matter. But it's easy for cultures to get into a way of living that uh, people can be profiled and other people don't even feel it, don't even notice it, that they're constantly being profiled and pulled over and harassed. Uh, And other people don't feel... Because it's not happening to them, it doesn't exist for them. So our world is being tested on this issue, whether we are truly all sons and daughters of God. I have been working, as many of you know, I've been writing my new book called As You Judge, which deals with the subject of the judgment. 
And since we have been examining uh, John 5.22, my father judges no one, and John 8.15, which says, are you missing something? Uh, John 8.15, which says, you judge after the flesh, I judge no one. Uh, that we are being asked to revisit the whole subject of the judgment. Now, I was talking to Azadu, we were chatting last night. She's in Norway and she has come into this message out of the New Age movement. And for... People in the new age, believing that God is loving and non-violent is not news to them. It's something they've known a long time, that God is loving. What's different about this is that we're actually producing this from the Bible and showing from the Bible that God is loving and kind and beautiful and all of these things, which is, that is a revolution. And to be able to produce this from the scripture itself. Because the Bible presents a picture of God, or what we thought was the picture of God, very different. As someone that, well, they're tolerant, but of course, ultimately, they are willing, he is willing to destroy uh, people if necessary. And as Eddie was talking about, in order to instill fear into you, as a number of people have said to me, well, our God is a holy God. And it's said with a furrowed brow, indicating that the way you instill holiness in people is you threaten to kill them if they don't do what you want. And that instills holiness or fear into people. But as we know, that doesn't last. It doesn't work. And everybody in North Korea knows that. It doesn't work. So, and other countries that exhibit, they all say, yes, we love you because if we don't say that, you'll kill us. So we have to say that we love you. In this journey, uh, I have had a tremendous time placing the context of the judgment into a new framework, uh, a new framework of understanding. For those of us that have been raised as Seventh-day Adventists, we are familiar with the doctrine of the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the blotting out of sin, the close of probation, the sealing of God's people, Christ's leaving of the most holy place in heaven. And all of these subjects, how do we put all of these together into the framework that God judges no one? That's no mean feat. <laughs> in terms of the way we were raised and what we understood in Daniel 7, that the Ancient of Days did sit and the books were open and the judgment was set. Names are retained, names are removed and all of these things. So today I want to present a facet of this in regards to the investigative judgment, a facet of what I've been writing about and to present some thoughts to you. But before we do that, let's kneel together and we will pray. <coughs> Our Father in heaven, what a joy it is to come before you and to know that we are your beloved children. To know that our Saviour rests in your arms and that you are breathing your spirit upon him. And through your beloved Son, we are receiving this spirit. We open our hearts to receive it, to know that you love us and that you care for us. And Father, there are a number of people today that are in need of health and healing. I think particular of John and Amelia, Lord, that have... Uh, um, Amelia's just had an operation and we do pray for her and John with the pain that he's been experiencing. Father, put your healing hands upon John and upon Amelia. Raise them up, we pray. And I think of another friend of ours, Ray DeLong, who's had a difficulty with his heart. And I pray that you would bless him and raise him up. We've heard that he's on the improve, which is a wonderful blessing. And I know that there are many others today that are having health difficulties. And we pray, Father, that your spirit would reach out to them. We know, as it says in Testimonies, Volume 2, page uh, 704, that on the Sabbath, those that keep the Sabbath with a devotional frame of mind, they are sent health, strength, and light. 
We pray for that strength and that light. Open our minds as we study the Word of God together. And we thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. As I've been writing this new book, I've been going back to the book Great Controversy because the material that we are writing, I am determined to anchor in the Adventist platform, the Adventist Foundation. I want to ensure that as I'm reading this material, which is the testimony of Jesus Christ, it is the words of Christ himself spoken through his prophet, Alan White, and I, when I read these words, I know that Christ is speaking to me and he's saying to me, Adrian, you have to include everything that's written in this book, Great Controversy. You have to account for everything in this volume when you are writing what you are writing. Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveal it to his servants, the prophets. And so it's a tremendous joy. This book is one of the best books ever to be written by a human being. And I distinctly remember back in 2006, I stood in the room of the house where Ellen White wrote the book, Great Controversy. And I confess that I wept as I stood there and thought, I am someone who can be in possession of this volume. I can know its contents. I can know... Uh, the framework in which the closing scenes of Earth's history will take place. And how many people do not know the things that I know? I am a debtor both to the Jew and to the Greek because of the things that have been granted to me as a Seventh-day Adventist living in these last days. And so this is one of the most important books that I have ever read in my life. There's one that I valued just a little bit more than this one, and that is the book Desire of Ages. And the one that I value supremely more than both of those is the Bible itself. But those are the next two books that are tremendously, uh, blessed me tremendously and helped me to understand the context in which we live. So I was rereading the chapter Facing Life's Record. Facing Life's Record. And for those of us that have been studying aspects of our father's character and I'll come over to we won't go up there just yet Reuben uh, you remember that the Bible is written in an interesting way and those of you who've studied with us you have noticed some interesting things like the question who was it that wanted Israel to go and spy out the land of Canaan whose idea was this if you read Numbers chapter 13, Numbers chapter 13, you will get one version, what appears to be one version. Numbers 13 verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers. Shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them? So reading Numbers chapter 13, you would get the understanding that it is God who is the one that has commanded the children of Israel to spy out the land, that it originated with him. But this is a test for God's people to see whether they are reading all that Scripture has to say. So when you come to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1 and you look at verse 22... It says, And you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And Moses says, And the saying pleased me well. God says, Go up and possess the land. And the children of Israel said, Ah, we're just a little bit afraid. <laughs> Wrong type of fear. Uh, we'd like to go and spy out the land and see whether we are actually able to do this. And so the story is quite different when you have more pieces to the puzzle. And their fears were confirmed. They were grasshoppers in the eyes of those giants on the walls 
of their cities. And they said, we can't do this. So, with that thought in mind, we want to turn, and I don't... Uh, yes, I do have this text, so we can go up to the screen, Reuben. Matthew 22, verses 10 to 14. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? I'm actually getting warm, and since I'm not on the screen, I will take off my number. There we go, like father, like son. Magnification. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. And so we have here a picture of a judgment that takes place. There is a wedding that takes place, and there are guests at the wedding. And the host, which is representing the father, is coming to see whether everyone has the wedding garment that he has supplied. Now, when we uh, look at the spirit of prophecy and the book Christ Object Lessons, we get a, a little bit more clarity on how we should understand this. By the king's examin examination of the guests at the feast is represented a work of judgment. The guests at the gospel feast are those who profess to serve God, those whose names are written in the book of life. Whose names are written in the book of life? Those who profess, those who profess to, serve God. to serve God. So this is those who come up in this judgment. But not all who profess to be Christians are true disciples. Before the final reward is given, it must be decided who are fitted to share the inheritance of the righteous. The decision must be made prior to the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven. For when he comes, his reward is with him to give to every man according as his work shall be. Revelation twenty two twelve. Before his coming, then, the character of every man's work will have been determined. Notice the words. Before his coming, then, the character of every man's work will have been determined. And to every one of Christ's followers, the reward will have been apportioned according to his deeds. And then it goes on. It is while men are still dwelling upon the earth that the work of investigative judgment takes place in the courts of heaven. The lives of all who profess to follow, uh, professed followers pass in review before God. All are examined according to the record of the books of heaven and according to his deeds, the destiny of each is fi forever what? Fixed. Fixed. The destiny of every soul, once this work of judgment is completed, the destiny of every soul is fixed. Is that what it says? Which means before the second coming of Christ, the destiny of every soul is fixed forever and can never be changed after this time. Because Christ says, I come and my reward is with me. And if his reward is with him at the second coming, it can't be changed after this. His reward is at the second coming. So as you think about, in this context of what we have read so far, what would you conclude from the evidence that has been presented? Who is the one that is initiating the judgment? And who, who is doing the investigation? And who is doing the deciding as who gets kept in and who stays out? Who would you conclude from the evidence we have presented thus far? God. God is the initiator of the judgment. God is testing every man's character. And he is willing to exclude those who are fake news so 
this is the context that we get, and we can get more, more quotes that would suggest this. Signs of the Times, August 6, 1885. When we become children of God, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. When we profess, when we accept Christ as our Saviour, we are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And they remain there until the time of the investigative judgment. Then the name of every individual will be called and his record examined by him who declares, I know thy works. Who's that? Who's the one that declares, I know your works? Christ. Christ. Revelation 2 and 3. I know your works. If in that day it shall appear that all our wicked deeds have not been fully repented of, our names will be blotted from the book of life and our sins will stand against us. Seems really cut and dry, doesn't it? God here is doing a work of judgment. So now I want to introduce for you a little bit more context for how this judgment takes place. This this view of the judgment has been the standard view of Seventh-day Adventists for a long, long time. God commences a work of judgment. Daniel 7 is at its centre and many other texts. God will bring every work into judgment. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Every idle word you shall speak, you shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. This is the picture that uh, we have understood. And into that mix, at least for myself, in 2018, was introduced the statement of Yeshua himself when he said, My father judges no one. And that was quite an incendiary explosion in the back of my brain going, whoa, I have a problem, Houston. We have a problem. How can this be? How can what Yeshua said match with everything that I know as a Seventh-day Adventist? My whole framework has been laid wrong. And my desire for character perfection had very much been based upon the fact that God himself is going to turn the pages of my book, look me square, as it were, in the spiritual eye and say, I don't know about you. I don't think you're going to make it. That's a motivator, isn't it? Does it motivate you? Have you ever read the chapter Facing Life's Record? Have you ever trembled? reading that chapter and thinking, I'm never going to make it. I can't make it. And then when you read things, if you read in the spirit of prophecy, it not only says sins of commission, what are those? Things that you have done, you have willfully done, but it says sins of omission. (laughs) Things that you ought to have done that you did not do. Oh, I'm done. I'm toast. Like, how you are recording the things that I ought to have done and I didn't do? Plus the ones that you could have done if given opportunity. Yes. The sins which you would have done had you had the opportunity, being born into a different family with different toys to play with, to hurt other people with. All of that is recorded against you. I have things recorded against me that I haven't even done. Right? But that I could have done had I had the opportunity to do. This view of the judgment has led many of God's people to despair and looking for a different Messiah to lead them away from this horrendous view of God's character. And we have had men in our recent history who have provided an alternative saying that there is no judgment. It's tempting, isn't it, to go to the opposite extreme and say, there is no judgment. Because they can quote the verses to say that my father judges no one, and if my father judges no one, there is no judgment. But that skews the scripture, because there definitely is a judgment. Every idle word you shall speak, you'll give account thereof on the day of judgment. We, we have to fit all these texts in. And so I want to introduce to you another passage that begins to offer a broader context for the wedding feast. Because when I read the wedding feast analogy of the investigative judgment, I receive the impression that it is God who is the initiator. God is the one who is driving the issues in the judgment. And God is the one that's going to blot you out of the book of life if you don't measure up. 
That's the impression I receive when I read this story. Bind him hand and foot and cast him, in, cast him into outer darkness, is what it says. So let's introduce some more material. Review and Herald, August 28, 1883. What though they have been counted, uh, what though they have been c- uh, counted the off-scouring of the earth, In the investigative judgment, their lives and character are brought in review before God. In what context? And that solemn tribunal reverses the decision of their enemies. Well, this is is a bit of a broader context now, isn't it? It uses the word investigative judgment. So we're talking about the investigative judgment. And their lives are brought in review... And that solemn tribunal reverses the decision of their enemies who have been counted the off-scouring of the earth. This is a completely different context in which God now is examining the record of every individual. Their faithfulness to God, to his word, stands revealed. And heaven's high honours are are awarded them as conquerors in the strife and sin, strife with sin and Satan. And I'd like to follow this line of thought and go a little bit deeper into the investigative judgment. I want to spend a little bit of time reading a fairly lengthy section of the book Christ Object Lessons and just draw a little bit more out of this theme in terms of the context of the investigative judgment. Judgment. And this is dealing with Joshua the high priest from Zechariah chapter 3. The people of God are here represented as a criminal on trial. In the investigative judgment, are we on trial? We're on trial, aren't we? A criminal on trial. We are represented as a criminal on trial. Joshua, as high priest, is seeking for a blessing for his people who are in great affliction. While he is pleading before God, Satan is standing at his right hand as his adversary. He is accusing the children of God. Who is the prosecutor? Satan Satan is the prosecutor in this trial, our criminal trial. And making their case appear as desperate as possible. Just as Ian Barker QC did to Lindy Chamberlain. Same spirit. He presented, for them that don't know, Lindy Chamberlain was the woman who was accused of killing her own baby when her baby was taken by a dingo. Those of us in Australia, very familiar. The biggest court case in Australian history. By the way, she was a Seventh-day Adventist. He presented before the Lord their evil doings and their defects. He shows their faults and failures hoping they will appear of such a character in the eyes of Christ that he will render them no help in their great need. He wants to make Christ give us up and say, these are hopeless. Look at how sinful they are. Joshua, as the representative of God's people, stands under Satan's And I've added the word Satan's condemnation. Why do I have the confidence and audacity to add the word Satan's condemnation? Because he's the only one that condemns. Because he that is in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And as it says in John 5.22, the Father condemns no one. So they stand and the context of the passage tells you that Satan is the one condemning them. So they stand under Satan's condemnation, but the word Satan is left out for the benefit of the reader to determine for themselves whose condemnation it is. Clothed with filthy garments, aware of the, of the sins of his people, he is weighed down with discouragement. Joshua is not only concerned about his own sins, he's concerned about the sins of his people. He's not saying, oh Lord, I thank you God, I'm not like the rest of my people. These evil people who are off worshipping false gods and doing all manner of evil. Satan is pressing upon his soul a sense of guiltiness that makes him feel almost helpless. Yet there he stands as a suppliant with Satan arrayed against him. 
The work of Satan as an accuser began in heaven. This has been his work on earth ever since man's fall. And it will be his work in a special sense as we approach, the, as we approach nearer to the close of the world, this world's history. Why? Because it's the time of the investigative judgment. He knows that he has a short time and his work of condemnation and attack on God's people is intensified. As he sees that his time is short, he will work with greater earnestness to deceive and to destroy. He is angry when he sees people on the earth who even in their weakness and sinfulness have respect to the law of Jehovah. Do you have respect to the law of Jehovah? Boy, you're making Satan angry. Do you fear his wrath? He who fears God does not fear Satan. Two fears. He is determined that they shall not obey God. He's determined that none of us here will obey God. We've got news for him. He delights in their unworthiness. Oh, do you feel unworthy? And has devices prepared, prepared for every human soul that all may be ensnared and separated from God. He seeks to accuse and condemn God and all who strive to carry out his purposes in this world in mercy and love, in compassion and forgiveness. This is what he is seeking to do. This is what he's doing right now. He's accusing you all. You believe in a God that is merciful, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. You are professing to believe in all of God's commandments, not just the ten, but the expansion of those ten in the statutes and judgments, the beautiful law of Moses. You would dare to stand up and say, I will remember the law of Moses with the statutes and the judgments. Well, you are in for a special treat from the enemy if you do this. So... We want to read a little bit more. Every manifestation of God's power for his people arouses the enmity of Satan. Do you think that it's some kind of accident that we have come into possession of a stream of information that presents God in the character that he is in, so beautiful, gracious, and long-suffering? It is a miracle of God that we should even possess these things, that we should have access to this material, and this angers Satan, that we should receive this material, that we should take hold of it, and dare to believe it. Every time God's work in, in their behalf... Satan with his angels work with renewed vigor to compass their ruin. Satan is seeking to compass our ruin in order to stop the work that we are doing and presenting our father as beautiful as he is. Satan is now at work to bring about a death decree to end our lives. That's what he wants. He is jealous of all who made Christ their strength. His object is to instigate evil, and when he has succeeded, throw all the blame upon the tempted ones. We will be blamed for the calamities that are coming upon the earth when God's law is transgressed and the nations of the world sign up to a decree forbidding, or rather forcing, God's people to worship on a day outside of the Sabbath hug that he gives his son. He presents their weakness and folly, their sins of ingratitude. Are you, are you guilty of being, having ingratitude towards God? Their unlikeness to Christ, which have dishonored their Redeemer. All this he urges as an argument, proving his right to work his will in their destruction. Satan is presenting his case. Hand them over to me. Look at their filthy lives. Look at their dis the disgrace. Look at the wretched things that they are doing. And their weakness, they have no care or concern for you. Hand them over to me. This is what Satan is saying right now. He endeavors to affright their souls with the thought that their case is hopeless. Have you ever been tempted with the thought that your case is hopeless? More than once. <laughs> that the stain of their defilement can never be washed away. He hopes so to destroy their faith that they will yield fully to his temptations and turn from their allegiance to God. The Lord's people cannot of themselves answer the charges of Satan. When you feel the weight of your sins, when you feel your flesh and you know that you have done things that you ought not to do, or you see the past, you look at the past, how many of us 
Look at the character of God, never judged, never condemned, and then compare it with your own character. Oh, woe is me. My life is full of condemnation of other people, whether secretly or openly. And Satan says, see, your whole life is a complete mess. You are nothing like God or his son. And Satan says, give up, he says to you. But, it says, well, as they look to, their, uh, look to themselves, they are ready to despair. When you look at yourself, <laughs> there's no hope. There is no hope. But, and this is one of those beautiful buts, but they appeal to their divine advocate. What gives them courage to uh, appeal to their divine advocate? Because they know that he is merciful, gracious, long-suffering. He doesn't give us his righteousness because we merit it. He gives us his righteousness because we need it. That's why he gives it to us. They plead the merits of the Redeemer. God can be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. With confidence the Lord's children cry unto him to silence the accusations of Satan. Where do you hear the accusations of Satan? Are they being blasted from some stereo system somewhere? Where do you hear the accusations of Satan? In my head. In my mind. Where it rings loudest. Where it rings the loudest. Where Satan says to you, you are filth. You are garbage. You are inconsistent. You are stupid. That's what he says to you. In your, does he, that's what he says to me. Fraud. You're a fraud. You're a hypocrite. Those words are going through your mind. Satan constantly is accusing. And when we look at ourselves, we have to agree with him, don't we? We can do nothing but agree with Satan and his accusations against us. But what do God's people do? They appeal to God to silence the accuser. Because there is nothing meritorious about our lives. If you were to take all that is holy, noble and just in man and offer it as God as having a part in the plan of salvation, it would be rejected as treason, as the Spirit of Prophecy says elsewhere. Notice what they pray and bring to naught his devices. Do me justice of mine adversary. This is what the woman prayed to the unjust judge. She pleaded to the unjust judge to silence her adversary. This is the context of the investigative judgment. To silence the adversary's accusations against you that condemn you and tell you that you are worthy of death. Do me, do me justice of mine adversary. They pray and with the mighty argument of the cross, who silences the bold accuser? Christ silences the bold accuser. Do you want to stop those voices that are in your head? Do you want to stop them? Yes. Pray to Christ with the mighty argument of the cross. The, this demonstrates God's love for us. He demonstrated his love for us. That when you feel those accusations that are coming against you, you take hold of it. I believe in what you have done for me, Lord Jesus. I believe that you forgive me of my transgressions. Please silence the voice of the accuser which condemns me day and night. This is what the investigative judgment is about. A little bit further, we read, The Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a, a brand plucked out of the fire? Who rebuked Satan? Us? The Lord. The Lord. So we were reading Christ's object lessons and we were getting a context of the judgment with expanded information from the parable of the wedding feast and the investigation that took place for the wedding garments. And we see that Satan in this case is the prosecutor and Christ, in fact, is the defender. He is our defense attorney using that analogy. And we see that it is the Lord that says unto Satan, the Lord Jesus Christ, says, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? When Satan seeks to cover the people of God with blackness and ruin them, Christ interposes. 
Hallelujah, sister. That was an appropriate interjection. Although they have sinned, Christ has taken the guilt of their sins. Where? What a beautiful saviour. Christ has for sin atonement made. He takes the guilt of our sins upon himself because he knows we could not carry them. He has snatched the race as a brand from the fire. By his human nature, he is linked with man, while through his divine nature, he is one with the infinite God. An understanding of the nature of Christ, both in his divine and human elements, is important and was, in fact, part of the 1888 message. Help is brought within the reach of perishing souls. The adversary is rebuked. And I want to add a few more statements. She introduced the element of Joshua the high priest as an illustration of this investigative judgment and Satan as the accuser, the prosecutor in the trial. And now I want to read to you another statement. To give us a bit more context for the judgment. This is in Christ Triumphant, page 186. Trials are permitted to come upon the chosen people of God. Who is the instigator of the trial? Satan. Satan. And I just want to add to you a little bit of context. When we uh, look at the story of the woman caught in adultery. Who is the one... Who are the ones who instituted the trial of this woman? The priests. The priests. It is the church that institutes the trial. This is really important for us to understand. The trial is instituted by the church because of the church's understanding of the character of God. Who is it that will institute a trial for God's people in the last days? Those who claim to represent him are actually trying to kill him. Those who claim to represent him and are actually seeking to kill him and replace his law with another. The church in the last days who claim to be followers of God are the one who institute the trial. They institute a death decree. They institute a law that no man will be able to buy or sell save they receive the mark of the beast in their forehead or in their hands. And so it is the church that will bring about this final trial for God's people. But, as it says here, trials are permitted to come upon God's people. The expressions are used. God tempted Abraham. God tempted the children of Israel. This means that the Lord permitted Satan to tempt them in order that their faith might be found unto honour and glory when the judgment shall sit. Do we get the context now? The context is that God permits, says this is the means that the Lord permits Satan to tempt them in order that their faith might be found unto honour and glory when the judgment shall sit and when every person shall be judged according to the deeds done in the body. That puts a different twist on why trials happen, doesn't it? So that there's evidence to bring up in the trial. So there's evidence. Yeah. Have you considered my servant Job? Yeah. Why are the life records of God's people brought up? Because there's an accuser. Because there's an accuser who has accused us day and night before the Father, mm -hmm. and thus the record is examined. God is not the prosecutor, Satan is the prosecutor. God is not the one that seeks to remove people from the book of life. Satan is the one who seeks to remove people from the book of life. But we have imposed the character of Satan onto God and imagined that he is the one who seeks to condemn and to destroy those who do not measure up to his commandments. Context is important. God knows every heart, every motive, every thought in the heart, but he permits Satan to try and tempt and test his believing ones in order that their trust and confidence in God may be revealed. So if Satan is the one who institutes and initiates this process of judgment, then who is the one who is the one that brings about the judgment in 1844? Who is the one that initiates this process? 
the accuser of the brethren. And God permits this to take place. He permits this to go ahead in order to test us to see whether we believe in what the words of his son had spoken when he was here on earth and the rest of scripture that he had spoken through the prophets. That's why he allows this test to come about. That's why he allows himself to be seated in the judgment seat and we will see what fear of God that we have. So, that has some context, doesn't it? Interesting, interesting. Let's have a look at another passage. Now let's come to the context in Daniel 7. We want to look at this because this is the passage upon which is based our understanding of the investigative judgment. And I just want to take you a little bit further on this and... Again, you know, when I was reading this last night, <laughs> I, was, uh, I started singing in the night seasons, How great is our God? How great is our God? Because it's right there in the text, but of course, you don't see it when you're in Laodicea. You're wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked to actually understanding of what this is. And I'm very, very thankful because a, a seed of doubt had been placed in my mind through the 1980s conflict when a man by, by the name of Desmond Ford says, the judgment in Daniel 7 has nothing to do with God's people. It's the judgment of the little horn. Have you ever heard that accusation? Mm -hmm. Is it a fair statement? It's a fair statement. It's a very fair statement. And it is one that has, I've pondered about and thought about, but context is everything. Let's have a look now at Daniel 7, verse 8 and 9. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Who is the little horn? Papacy. We don't, we're not going to the whole context of this right now. Before whom there were three, uh, of, sorry, were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in, the, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So this little horn is speaking great things. Who is this little horn speaking great things to? People. The people. And then in the midst of the little horn speaking these great things, what happens? I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garments were was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as, a burn of, uh, wheels as burning fire. Is the actions here of God a response to the great words that the little horn spake? Is he responding to the little horn? Is there a connection between verse 8 and verse 9? We would have to assume that verse 9 is a response to verse 8. The little horn is speaking great words. But it's further down in the chapter that we get the true context of these great words that the little horn speaks. This is what it says in verse 21 and 22. In the interpretation, when, when the interpretation is given to Daniel, I beheld and the same horn made war with who? Saints. The saints. And prevailed against them. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. Does that parallel with what we've just been talking about? That the little horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. And what do we see through the dark ages? Where do we see God's people? What is happening to God's people? They are arrayed before the judgment seat of the papacy of the church. And they are vilified they are accused, they are defamed. And each Christian's record was being written as to whether they would trust in God for his grace in the face of such uh, blasphemy and such false accusation and wrong things. They were, as it says, the ancient of days came. The little horn had given a picture of the life record of these individuals and the ancient of days came and gave a true record of these individuals and whether they trusted in him or not and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom this is the context yes 
There is a judgment of the little horn taking place, but Satan is the accuser and God is the defender. This is the context. This is what Adam Clark says. The same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Dot, dot, dot means Adam Clark in this case is hedging his bets and he's saying, well, those who believe in Antiochus Epiphanes think this and those who believe in the Pope think this is the little horn. Those who understand that popedom by it, the little horn, seeing this as referring to the cruel persecutions of the popes of Rome against the Waldenses, the Albigenses and the Protestant church in general. So this is what we see taking place. So I want to, us to walk through in, the, in uh, this morning, just to walk through one of those cases to get an idea of how Satan through the church, sought to persecute God's people. And this is highly relevant to us because we are on the verge of this being repeated, aren't we? Mm. And do we understand that in allowing these trials to come upon us, our life record is brought up before heaven? And I want to say that in this final movement of earth's history, as, our, as we are arrayed before the kings of this earth, for our belief in God and his only begotten son, we will know that the judgment of the living has begun. Because it's in the, it is in the process that we go through with the beast and its image that determines whether we are victorious or not. And because we are writing our own life record through this process, and this is the judgment of the living. We are the ones that write the record. Do we believe... Does our anchor hold when we are being faced by the world and by the religious leaders of this world and we are being frowned upon and we are being persecuted for our faith? What is the record that you will write in your life history? What will be written into your heart and into the palms of Christ when you are faced with that type of persecution? This is the judgment of the living because God judges no one. Because he's victorious. Because he is victorious, we are victorious. To him that believeth. So let us have a bit of a look. I want to read you. This is from Great Controversy, page 112. It says here, He, Jerome, pointed to his hearers, pointed his hearers to the long line of holy men who had been condemned by who? Unjust, Unjust judges. Representing Satan, the accuser of the brethren. In almost every generation have been those who, while seeking to elevate the people of their time, have been reproached and cast out, but who in later times have been shown to be deserving of honour. Christ himself was condemned as a malefactor at the unrighteous tribunal. This is what Jerome is saying to his accusers. At his retraction, Jerome had assented to the justice of the sentence condemning Huss. He now declared his repentance and bore witness to the innocence and holiness of the martyr. I knew him from his childhood, he said. He was a most excellent man, just and holy. He was condemned notwithstanding his innocence. I also, I am ready to die. That's a man of courage, isn't it? Mm. Whose courage? His? No. Christ's. I will not recoil before the torments that are prepared for me by mine enemies and false witnesses who will one day have to render an account for their impostures before the great God whom nothing can deceive. Brave words for a man about to die. In self-reproach for his own self-denial of the truth, Jerome continued, of all the sins that I have committed since my youth, none weigh so heavily upon my mind and cause me such poignant remorse as that which I committed in this fatal place when I approved of the iniquitous sentence rendered against Wycliffe and against the holy martyr John Huss. My master and my friend, yes, I confess it from my heart and declare with horror that I disgracefully quailed when through a dread of death I condemned their doctrines. I therefore supplicate almighty God to deign the pardon Deign to pardon me of my sins. And this one in particular, the most heinous of all, pointing to his judges, he said firmly, you condemned Wycliffe and John Huss, not for having shaken the doctrine of the church, but simply because they branded with, 
They branded with reprobation the scandals proceeding from the clergy, their pomp, their pride, and all the vices of their prelates and priests. The things which they have affirmed and which are irrefutable, I also think, I, I also think and declare like them. His words were interrupted. The prelates, trembling with rage, cried out, What need is there of further proof? We behold with our own eyes the most obstinate of heretics. Is that a familiar scene? You have heard the blasphemy. Unmoved by the tempest, Jerome exclaimed, What? Do you suppose that I fear to die? You have held me for a whole year in a frightful dungeon, more horrible than death itself. You have treated me more cruelly than a Turk, Jew or pagan. And my flesh has literally rotted off my bones alive, and yet I make no complaint, for lamentation ill becomes a man of heart and spirit. Wow. But I cannot but express my astonishment at such great barbarity towards a Christian. Again the storm of rage burst out, and Jerome was hurried away to prison. Yet there were some in the assembly upon whom his words had made a deep impression and who desired to save his life. He was visited by dignitaries of the church and urged to submit himself to the council. <laughs> I cannot and I will not recant. The most brilliant prospects were presented before him as a reward of renouncing his opposition to Rome. But like his master, when offered the glory of the world, Jerome remained steadfast. This is the record that Jerome has written. Jerome, who failed and tripped under the pressure and the fear of death, yet Christ recovered him and redeemed him. Oh, when, when Jerome, when he fell, how Satan would have taunted Christ and said, See, see. He doesn't believe in you. And then now when Jerome stands firm, oh, how heaven rejoiced. Oh, how Satan raged through the priests to think that his prey had escaped him. And that he was assured of eternal glory for allowing Christ to manifest himself in him. This is the judgment. So when there is a review of the records, when our Saviour comes to the case of Jerome and he is determined to raise him from the dead, Satan is there as the accuser to oppose him. And Christ reveals the record of Jerome to Satan and says simply these words, The Lord rebuke you. The case is here. He has confessed belief in my righteousness. He has trusted in my mercy. He has trusted in my grace. The Lord rebuke you. I have nothing to say to you. The record. This is the process by which Christ and his Father examine our records. They do not examine our records to prosecute us and to attack us. They examine our records to defend us. And to find those who have faith as opposed to those who have none. And of course, unfortunately, there will be those whom have confessed the name of Christ, that when Christ produces the record, the record will show that that person did not have faith and that they themselves had already taken their name out of the book of life before they had died. And the record simply bears the fact of these things. Oh, I thought you were saying there's a problem. It's sad for that person, isn't it? That you should lose hope. I guess I was just cringing It's proved that they did not stand. He has to, he has to sadly let that person go. But there are many who went back to Rome mm -hmm. and chose to protect their temporal life and yield up, like Esau did, their eternal weight of glory. Mm -hmm. And so we see this is the context of the investigative judgment. Satan is the accuser. Daniel 7 tells us that the little horn made war against the saints of God. But God stood. And so this is what we see. Uh, well, we'll continue with Jerome. 
Jerome says now, prove to me from holy writings that I am an error, he said, and I will abjure it. The holy writings, he's claimed one of his tempters, is everything then to be judged by them? Who can understand them till the church has interpreted them? I remember on the night of my judgment when I said that the only begotten son was my master. And it was said to me by the leader of the church, we don't use that name anymore, begotten. Must we follow everything by the scriptures? It's my testimony, the begotten son. Are there traditions of men more worthy of faith than the gospel of our Saviour, replied Jerome? Oh, sorry, I missed the part where it says, Who can understand them till the church has interpreted them? We will place our 28 fundamental statements upon the scriptures and you will submit to them or we will disfellowship you. It's the same voice. It is the same voice over and over. You must submit to the church. You must surrender your individual conscience to the church. I will not, sir. Are the traditions of men more worthy of faith than the gospel of our Saviour, replied Jerome? Paul did not exhort those to whom he wrote to listen to the traditions of men, but said, search the scriptures. Heretic was the response. I repent, having pleaded so long with you. I see that you are urged upon by the devil. Ere long sentence of condemnation was passed upon him, he was led out to the same spot upon which Hus had yielded up his life. He went singing on his way. His countenance lighted up with joy and peace. Christ was with him, wasn't he? Christ was rejoicing in what Jerome had stood faithfully for the cross of Christ. And now Jerome is enabled to taste of that eternal weight of glory. And it was written into his record so that when Jerome's case comes up after 1844, when Christ is determined to raise this beautiful man from the dead, Satan opposes Christ and he simply brings out Huss's record, uh, Jerome's record, and says, the Lord rebuke you. His gaze was fixed upon Christ, and to him death had lost its terrors. When the executioner, about to kindle the pile, stepped behind him, the martyr exclaimed, Come forward boldly, apply the fire before my face. Had I been afraid, I should not have been here. Such is the faith of Jesus Christ given to a man who has yielded himself completely to him to face his accusers in the judgment. His last words uttered as the flames rose about him were a prayer. Lord Almighty Father, he cried, have pity on me and pardon me my sins, for thou knowest that I have loved thy truth. I have always loved thy truth. His voice ceased, but his lips continued to move in prayer. When the fire had done its work, the ashes of the martyr with the earth upon which they rested were gathered up and like those of Hus were thrown into the Rhine. What a beautiful picture. And into the Rhine and it flowed out. The ashes went out across the world. And this is what happens for God's people in Daniel chapter 12. Because the little horn power once again will seek to establish its seat between the sea and the holy mountain. It will seek to interpose itself between God and his children. And they will accuse those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And it is in this time that the judgment of the living will be played out. And what will be our testimony? We will have our moments like Martin Luther when he had to face the council. Martin's investigative judgment took place while he was alive and his record was laid down so that when Christ comes to raise Martin Luther from the dead, his record bears its own witness. He has laid his witness and Christ simply says to Satan, the Lord rebuke you for seeking to prevent my son Martin from being raised. And Daniel 12, 1, And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. The time of trouble here is not only the time of trouble in the flesh. It is the time of trouble in the spirit. 
in your mind when Satan is accusing you that you are unworthy of eternal life and you cry out, Lord, let me be avenged of my accuser. Let justice be done. Silence the voice of the accuser which speaks against me and seeks to convince me that I cannot have eternal life. I believe in the merits of your blood. I believe in the cross of Christ. I believe that your righteousness is my robe. I will enter the heavenly city wearing your heavenly garment, the wedding garment. I believe you'll give it to me, not because I'm good, not because I'm righteous, but because you are righteous and you are good and you have promised it to me. Every one of us who is going to stand in these last days will have that time of trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble where you will be in conflict and maybe you will stumble like Jerome did. That's why I chose his case to share with you that if you have stumbled, if you have fallen and you feel like there is still no hope for you, remember Jerome. Remember what Jerome did and how bravely he stood after so cowardly turning and giving in to Satan. Still for him, there was found eternal life. Beautiful. And so... The context in which we understand the investigative judgment is clearly laid out in Daniel chapter 7. That the little horn, who was Satan's representative, made war against the saints and brought them to trial and brought them to condemnation and sought to rub out the testimony of their lives. But God comes in the investigative judgment, as we read, and reverses the decision of those tribunals. It reverses those decisions and God stands for his children. And I think this is a beautiful way to see the investigative judgment. It presents it in a completely different light, doesn't it? We thought God was our accuser. We thought God was the one that was examining us. Yes, he examines us not to destroy us, but to defend us against Satan, the accuser of the brethren. Uh, There is a, a nice hymn uh, in the old hymn book, I think it's, uh, it's is my name written there? Oh, that's right. But oh, we don't have it on the screen, do we? <laughs> We're not up to, I think it's 600 and something, so we wouldn't be up there yet. So I don't have the words. Is there plenty of books? Well, it's the old hymnal, brothers and sisters. Uh, if you have the app, you can look at it. Is it 617? In the old? It is 617. I remember that hymn because that's the hymn my mother chose for me for my baptism in 1979. And it's not in the new, is that correct? It's not in the new. So if someone can hand me a hymnal, I would appreciate it. Join me. <laughs> Lord, I care not for riches. And on the final verse, we will sing, Yes, my name's written there. Because you need to overcome. <laughs> But the blood of my Savior 
is sufficient for me. For thy promise is written in bright letters that glow. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them like snow. Amen. Is my name written there on the page wide and fair in the book of thy kingdom? Is my name written there? Oh, that beautiful city with its mansions of light, with its glory in pure garments of white when no evil thing cometh to despoil what is fair when the angels are watching is my name written there let's say yes yes my name's written there on the page white and fair in the book thy kingdom yes my name's written there let us kneel together father in heaven we give you thanks we give you praise we give you honor for giving us the true context of the judgment you are not our prosecutor. You are our father. You delight to deliver your children. But you allow Satan to tempt us, to test us, in order to bring forth that precious gold. We pray, dear Yeshua, that you would give us that gold tried in the fire. Gold that is tried under test, under examination, under investigation by the enemy. You allow the enemy to test us in order to see whether we truly believe in your righteousness and in your goodness. We pray that we will overcome and that we choose to believe that our name is written there and you will not blot out our names from the book of life. And I thank you for hearing this prayer in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So examined and encountered. Yes. Yes. All right, we thank you, brothers and sisters. Uh, did you have a presentation, brother? You do? Yes, Ruben will be on at 3 o'clock in just over 90 minutes. Thank you, brothers and sisters. God bless. People lost their